So this is just a quick video uh, going over the material of MYP3 Unit 1. Here are the contents. Uh, we'll deal with these five things very quickly. So chapter one, we talked about the Fibonacci sequence. Um, so if you want to take the notes, just pause the video. They say, consider the following sequence, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and so on. So each number is the sum of the previous two. 1 plus 1 makes 2, 1 plus 2 makes 3, 2 plus 3 makes 5, 3 plus 5 makes 8, and so on. So that's called the Fibonacci sequence after the mathematician who uh, first came up with it. And if you divide successive Fibonacci numbers, um, this is what you get. Well, I'll just zoom in on this. Okay, so the first two Fibonacci numbers are 1 followed by 1. We can't do anything with the first one on its own, but the, the first two, 1 divided by 1, makes 1. So the ratio between the first two Fibonacci numbers is 1. Then we keep doing that. 2 divided by 1 is 2. 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. 5 divided by 3 is 1.66. 6 recurring or round to 6, 7. 8 divided by 5 is 1.6. 13 divided by 8, 1.625. And we kept doing that. And then we noticed as we went along, this... Um, ratio between successive terms tended to converge towards a particular value around 1.618. So we got closer and closer to 1.618 as we went along. So we took a little note about that. We observed that the ratio between successive terms in the Fibonacci sequence seems to tend towards a particular value around 1.618. So that was the Fibonacci sequence and then um, do pause the video if you miss notes in class about that and take the notes from the screen. Moving on to the next little chapter, the golden ratio. So we just saw that the number um, that we just got, that successive ratios between terms of the Fibonacci sequence tends towards, is around 1.618, that number we just got before. But it can actually be shown to be exactly square root of 5 plus 1, all of that divided by 2. Um, so there, there is a way that you can show how it comes to exactly that. We won't cover it in this unit, but it's certainly something uh, you can talk to me about in class if you wish. Um, so that's often referred to as the golden ratio, or the Gulmusnit in Danish, and you often find that things divided up in proportions based on this number are found to be especially pleasing to the eye. And then also many things in nature are found to be related to the Golden Ratio and the Fibonacci sequence. So if you didn't get that note in class, um, do pause the video, take that note now, and then Moving on, um, this is something you can draw. It's called a Fibonacci snail shell. So you start with a square that is one, let's say, centimeter or, um, or a square in your book, one square wide. You put next to it another square that's one square wide. And then next to that, next to those two, you put one that just fits along the side. So that's two square squares wide because it's, 1 plus 1. Then you do another one on top of that, and because that's 1 plus 2, that's 3 squares wide. And then you do another one next to that, um, and because that's 3 plus 2, it's 5 squares wide. So you keep adding squares like that, and each square has a side length that's equal to the previous 2. So this next one is 3 plus 5 which is 8. So because it's each two numbers added up to get the next one, it's basically following the Fibonacci sequence. And then if you get a compass and draw these little quarter circles in each of those, you get something that kind of resembles a snail shell. 
So that's something you can easily draw with a ruler and the squares in your book and a compass. Do use a proper compass rather than trying to draw that freehand. Um, and you get that nice sort of appealing snail shell kind of pattern. Well, what we did next in class was to uh, look at some other things that we found on the internet that had that same kind of pattern to them. So I googled, uh, for example, Donald Trump uh, Fibonacci. Interesting to see what other things come up, isn't it? Fibonacci. And there were some interesting images there of a picture of Donald Trump and how it seemed to follow the same Fibonacci snail shell pattern. So that was interesting. And then all sorts of other things, pictures of hurricanes. Um, let's just uh, do art Fibonacci sequence and let's see what it comes up with. Okay, so all sorts of things where crucial parts in the composition of pictures seem to lie in places that follow the Fibonacci spiral. Um, there's another one there. So you can kind of Google those yourselves and see all sorts of interesting things in art and nature that seem to have this Fibonacci pattern to them. So back to the main notes. So we looked at some videos on spirals in nature. This is a series of three videos uh, by the excellent V Hart. Um, so you can find those yourself and have a look at them and I'll also link them anyway on Manage Back. And then we moved on to tessellation. So tessellation is the property of shapes to be able to fit together to make a tiling pattern. So squares tessellate, they fit together. You can make a tiling pattern out of squares um, without gaps in between. So squares tessellate, you can fit them together without gaps to make a tiling pattern, but this does not work for regular pentagons, which is five sides. You see, if you try to fit them together, you get a little bit of a gap there that you can't fit another one in. So the reason that squares tessellate is because that their angle is 90 degrees and 90 degrees goes exactly into 360 degrees four times. So all the way around is 360 degrees. So you can fit exactly four 90s around a point around 360 degrees. So 90 goes exactly into 360 four times. So we can fit four squares around a single point, as you can see there. However, the angle in a regular pentagon is 108 degrees. 360 divided by 108 is three and a bit. So you can get three pentagons around a point, but then with a little bit left over. So you've got a little gap left over. So that's tessellation. Um, again, take the note if you didn't manage to do that in class. Pause the screen and moving on. So the next bit is a recap of how to figure out the angle in a regular polygon. So for example, uh, the sides in a pentagon add up to 540, and the way you can figure out this is to split it into three triangles. So there's your pentagon with five sides, and if you just start from a particular point there and draw out to the other vertices of the pentagon, you can see that something with five sides can be split into three triangles with all of those triangles coming from a particular point. And that's quite important that they all come from that same point rather than just being any three triangles anywhere. So three times 180 makes 540, which is why you know that a pentagon adds up to 540. It's important to note here that all of the angles are around the edge so all of the angles that are in the triangles are also around the edge of the pentagon. So they're also the angles in the pentagon. So anyway, if a pentagon adds up to 540 and there's five angles in a pentagon, then each angle in a regular pentagon is 540 divided by 5, which is 108. 
So if you want to draw a nice regular pentagon with all five sides the same, then each one is 108 degrees. So that's just a recap from MYP1, uh, or MYP2 possibly. Um, and you can apply that to a hexagon, six sides. So again, from a particular point, you just make triangles out from that point, and you can make four of them. So those four triangles have got angles um, of 180 degrees each. Four times 180 is 720. So each angle in a regular hexagon is 720 divided by six this time, because you've got six sides, and that makes 120. So a hexagon adds up to 720, and then if you want to make a nice regular one, then each angle has got to be 720 divided by six, 120. I can go on with that for all sorts of sides. Um, an octagon, eight sides. Try and split an octagon into triangles from a particular point, and you get six triangles. Um, so each triangle is 180 degrees. Six times 180 is 1080. So the angles in a regular octagon add up to 1080 degrees. Then if you want to, or not just a regular octagon, but um, any octagon, the angles in any octagon. But if you want to make a nice regular one, then the 1080 degrees divided by the eight angles give you 135 degrees each. So each angle in a regular octagon is always 135 degrees. So you might by now have spotted a pattern. So when you try and generalize this into a formula, you're doing the number of sides, so that's called n here, but then minus two, because it always splits into a number of triangles that's two fewer than the number of sides. Then each of those triangles is 180 degrees, so we do times 180. So in the formula, that's why I've got times 180. And then if we want to make a nice regular one, we divide that total by the number of sides. So here I divided by eight to get 135 degrees, but generally you divide by the number of sides. So generally the angle in a regular n-sided polygon, each angle has to be n minus two in brackets times 180, and then all of that divided by n. So if, for example, you want to know about a shape with 10 sides, you just stick 10 into that formula and do 10 minus 2 times 180 divided by 10, and that will tell you how many degrees each angle needs to be if you want to do a nice regular polygon with 10 sides. So we looked at the um, different polygons you could have and whether they tessellate together. So does it tessellate? We made a table. So we had the number of sides in the shape. Then we worked out the angle in the regular shape from that formula. So for example, when you've got three sides, n equals three. So you stick three into that formula and you do three minus two times 180 divided by three. And that gives you 60. And you know, of course, that a, a nice equilateral triangle has a 60 degree angle in. And we did that for different numbers of sides. We worked out the angle. So four sides, 90 degrees, five sides, 108 degrees, six sides, 120 degrees, seven sides, 128 point around six, not, not a nice round number, eight sides, 135 degrees, nine sides, 140 degrees, 10 sides, 144 degrees, 11 sides, 147 and a bit, 12 sides, 150 degrees. So those are all the angles that you would have to have if you did a regular polygon with that number of sides. Then in the third row of this table, we ask the question, does it tessellate? So a, an equilateral triangle with a 60 degree angle, 360 divided by 60 is six. So that means you can fit exactly six triangles six equilateral triangles around a point, and it'll go six times exactly. So yes, it will tessellate. Then with squares, we already looked at squares, just going back a couple of pages. 
We already saw that squares tessellate because 360 divided by 90 is 4, so you can fit 4 squares around a point. So going back to my table there, so that's just what I did there. I said 360 divided by 90 degrees makes 4, so that means you can fit 4 squares exactly around a point. So yes, it does tessellate. On to uh, pentagons. So a pentagon has a 108 degree angle if you do a nice regular one. 360 divided by 108 is three and a bit. So you can fit three pentagons around a point, but then you have a little bit left over. So no, it doesn't tessellate because it doesn't divide exactly. Um, and then hexagons. Hexagon is 120 degrees. 360 divided by 120 is exactly three. So you can fit exactly three hexagons together around a point, And yes, it will tessellate. So we did that calculation for all of them. And then the rest of them ended up as, as no. So seven sides, eight sides, nine sides, 10, 11, and 12. You couldn't fit any more um, exactly around a point. So the only ones that tessellated together were um, equilateral triangles, squares, and regular hexagons. But of course, you can make tessellation patterns from combinations of different shapes. So you could get octagons with squares together. Regular octagons have 135 degrees. So if I have two octagons and a square together, like I've got just here, two octagons and a square, and I've got 135 plus 135 plus 90, and that makes exactly 360 degrees. So it does fit together around a point. Okay, so we did that in class, and um, if you didn't manage to copy that note in class, then pause the video, do it now, and then you can try and create your own tiling combinations. Okay, and then we briefly looked at some other interesting things, so Islamic tiling patterns and the art of M.C. Escher. So we did weird things with optical illusions, so, so this is a staircase that always seems to be going up or always seems to be going down, depending on which way you're looking at it. But he also did some interesting stuff with uh, tessellations, so this is a kind of tessellating bird and fish things thing, but the, the birds kind of morph into fish. Um, and all sorts really. So there's a very good museum in the um, town of Den Haag, or The Hague in the Netherlands, um, the MC Escher Museum. So if you're ever in The Hague, then do go and visit that.